Hello everyone! We're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video and a heart-stopping top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, 10 treasures the world's poorest man left us when he died. We all know that the Lord Jesus became poor so we could be rich. So poor he had to say, show me a penny. So poor he had to borrow a boat and a donkey, even a grave. They even took his clothes. But the question we're asking today is how rich did he leave us in the process? This sweet little study should leave us all flabbergasted. I doubt we will ever complain again. So here's number one. He gives us his new kind of life. Exactly. It's not just longer life, eternal life. It's a new quality of life. And it wasn't simply that he gave us a chunk of life as a gift, which we might mess up. Actually, he gave himself as the life. When he said, I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish, this life is in his son. So what the Lord gave us was guaranteed safe, right? So your life is hidden with Christ in God. So the only way I could lose my eternal life is if God lost Christ, which of course is ridiculous. So the first thing we lay hold of is this idea that all the blessings flow out of that life. The life that he gave me was actually himself. I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. No greater gift has ever been imagined that God should actually give me my life in Christ so that Christ secures my life. Treasure number two, he gave his body and blood for us. When we look at the emblems on a Sunday morning and we see the bread and wine, we should never forget it was real a real cross they were real thorns and real a real spear and real nails the lord jesus when he offered himself let's remember this that no one took anything from him he said no one takes my life from me i lay it down of myself and the scripture says he gave his back to the smiter he gave his cheek to those who plucked off the hair and it's a deeply moving statement to join with paul and say the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. I mean, what more could he give? After he'd given everything else away, he gave his own body. In those emblems, we see these two truths, that in the body of Christ, we see the way that God came near to us. God was manifest in flesh. And in the blood, we see the way that we come near to God through this new and living way which he has consecrated through his own blood, he now brings us near to him. So this is a fabulous gift. It's just wonderful beyond imagination that the Son of God would be given a perfect body and that he would offer that body up so that he might bring us near to God and bring God near to us. Treasure three, he gave his yoke to us. Now this one's a little surprising. Some people object to that and they and they push back on this idea and they say, well I'd rather cut my own swath if you don't mind. In Matthew chapter 11 verses 29 and 30, the Lord Jesus explains that there are two kinds of rest. He said, take my yoke on you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you'll find rest to your souls. Now this is the second kind of rest. Earlier on he says, come to me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. This is rest as a gift. This is the rest of salvation. We rest where God rests in the finished work of Christ. But then there's the unfinished work of Christ. He comes alongside us now in resurrection life and says, I'm willing to be yoked with you and we can go together through life. I will help you with life's decisions and challenges and heartaches and burdens, and we can move together in this. And so there are people who have received life as a gift in salvation. They have not yet 
discovered life as a daily enjoyment, a daily experience, when I agree to yoke myself with him, then he gives me daily rest. Rest as an acknowledgement that things are as they ought to be because I am now walking in concert with the Lord Jesus. I'm agreeing with him. I'm moving in his purposes. Treasure four, he put his name on us. Yes, that's a wonderful truth, isn't it? The name that is above every name, the name that God has given the highest place in all the universe, the name before which every knee will bow, that name has been given to us. It's our little name tag. And so we are now Christ's ones. We are his own. And the scripture declares, the Lord Jesus promises in John 14, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The Father loves to bless his Son. He loves to honor his Son. And when we're linked with the Son, that's why when we pray, I don't say, hello, this is Jade Nicholson. I come in the name of the Lord Jesus because God honors that name. So name equals character. That's the idea here. So whatever we ask, we should ask consistent with the character of Christ. He never did a selfish thing ever, right? He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom. So when I think about taking that name and asking God, I'm going to ask him for things consistent with the character of Christ. And if I do, Jesus says it's an open sesame to all the treasures of heaven. You can pray down the blessings of God on you and those around you if you understand this principle that God wants not simply to provide for your needs, but in the process, he wants to honor his son. Treasure five, he gave his command to us to love each other. One of the important things to understand about the commands of the Lord is that, as some have said, his commands are his enablings. So when I command my children to do something, I'm not necessarily providing them with the physical strength or the wisdom or whatever it is they need to do it. But God does. When the Lord gives us a command, included in that command is the power to do it. So there's no excuse here. We say, Lord, I'm sorry, I can't do this. Well, of course you can't. But that's the whole point of Christian living, that he can do it through us. It's the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's given to us. So the Lord Jesus says in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. Some people say, well, how's that new? I mean, doesn't the Bible tell us to love all the way through? Well, yes, but it's new in its intent. It's this idea that we are now the ecclesia. We're called out of the world. The world has rejected us. And now we have this new family, this new society that's going to be marked by love. And people are going to know we're his disciples if we love each other. In other words, we've learned from him how to love sometimes unlovable people because that's what this supernatural love does. So it's new in its intent. It's new in its extent, he says, to love one another as I have loved you. He's left an example for us. He laid down his life for us, and the scripture says we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So that's it. key difference in just simply loving loving the way he loved it, really ramps it up now and moves it into the realm of impossible unless his love is actually the love that's flowing through me. And then, of course, it's new in its content. We read here that the joy of God is manifested in our love. God doesn't love begrudgingly. He loves spontaneously. He loves compassionately. His love is the best kind of love, this agape love, which doesn't seek reciprocation, doesn't see payback. It just loves to love because it's love. And that's the new kind of love that he's given us. Our sixth treasure is that he leaves his peace with us. Again, John 14, 
the Lord Jesus, as it were, is giving his last will and testament. And he's saying to his disciples, I'm not leaving you a nice villa by the Mediterranean or, or a farm up in the Hula Valley, but this is what I can leave you, something better than that, because it will be yours for eternity. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The world's peace is the cessation of hostilities, basically. It's the person saying, you know, my weapons are bigger than your weapons, so you better behave yourself. But the peace of God is different. It's not the absence of turmoil. It's the presence of the Lord in the midst of the storm. It's walking with Jesus on the stormy sea. As long as he's with me, I have this wonderful peace. And so this should mark us out in the world. If we have all our nerve endings hanging out and we're telling people Jesus gives peace, you know, we're like toothpaste salesmen with bad breath. We need to manifest by our lives that the peace of God is real and that we know that God has his hand, his control over the circumstances of life and we can just rest in that. Treasure number seven, he gave his words for us to know and obey. This is, I think, the most precious commodity transaction that has ever occurred, where the mind of God, through the life of Christ, practically applies these divine principles to daily circumstances. Jesus showed us how to treat a prostitute, how to treat a leper, how to treat little children, how to treat our wives. In every area of life, the Lord Jesus wasn't simply talking about these things. He was doing these things. The New Testament commentary says the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. And so when the Lord Jesus tells us to do something, he doesn't ask us to do a thing that he hasn't already done himself and laid out a model, a pattern for us, so that we not only know what to do, but how to do it. And that's exactly what we have in the words of Christ. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. If you abide in my words, you are my disciples indeed. And so I need to ask myself practically, are there verses in the Bible that make me uncomfortable? This idea of abiding in the word means that the word of God rests easy on my conscience. So if there are things that I'd rather not hear about, they offend me, they, they give me a guilty conscience, I need to deal with that because this is the loving Jesus that's telling me this. He's telling me these things for my own good. And so I need to respond positively to these wonderful words. He says, that his words are more important than the whole universe. The universe may pass away, but no, lay hold of this and live out this truth. And I'll tell you this, every truth that you live out manifests in your life another aspect of the loveliness of Christ. The truth is in Jesus. And when we respond to the truth, we become more like him. And that's the goal. It should be the life goal of every believer to be more like Jesus. And the path to that is to trust and obey, to trust what he says and obey what he says. And if I do that, then every day I'll become a little less like my old self and a little more like the Lord Jesus. Treasure 8, he left his joy to be in us. What is joy? I suggest that joy is like the shock absorbers on the bumpy road of life. If you see somebody in their shock absorbers, are gone, are not working. There are a couple of things you notice. Problem with oversteer, it's hard to stay balanced. And when they hit a bump, they can't get over it. And so joy gives us this ability to compensate for the difficulties and the, the swerving of life. Life is constantly changing directions and there are constant, we're hitting bumps in the road of life. And when we have joy in the Lord, it gives us that sense that even if we're sorrowful, we can still be rejoicing. Sorrow is an emotion of the soul, but joy is a fruit of the Spirit. 
And so even in the midst of difficulty, Jesus, the night he was betrayed, sang with the disciples. For joy, he gave up all that he had. And so joy is not merely circumstantial happiness. Joy is deep and fundamental. And it gives me this resilience to be able to take the blows of life and not to overreact. So joy flows out of that knowledge that all is well with my soul and nothing fundamental can ever change in a Christian's life. Even the hardest times, God is still on the throne, Christ is my savior, the Holy Spirit indwells me, heaven is my home, his promises are true. So that superficial things change things that may be very hard to bear, but in the end, the fundamental things always stay the same. And that's why I can have joy as I realize that the fullness of that joy comes through my daily moment-by-moment relationship with the Lord Jesus. It's the joy of the Lord that's our strength. It's not us trying to find happiness in life, pursuing happiness. It's the joy of the Lord that is our strength, as Nehemiah said. Treasure number nine, he shares his glory with us. Well, as the young people say, you know, you realize this is absolutely astounding to think of it, that as we go down this list of all the things that the Lord leaves us, he says, as he prays to his father in John 17, the glory which you gave me, I've given them, that they may be one just as we are, I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you've sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So what is this glory? It's not a shiny face, obviously. It's a capacity to reveal what God is thinking. So when you look at a flower, you're looking at the mind of God frozen in time. You see what God was thinking when he came up with that flower. You look at this amazing universe and the heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, they show us the character of God. His, his power and his wisdom and his generosity is seen in that. When you look at a sinner, you don't see what God was thinking when he made them. You see what they're thinking. As a man thinks, so is he. But when Christ gives us his glory, he gives us, he restores to us the capacity to show people what God is thinking. So when I look with love on an unlovable person, when I generously give, when I could really afford to use the money myself, I'm showing something of the character of God that men may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So it restores to fallen man this wonderful link, this capacity so that when people look at me, they think of God. And this is partly the work of Christ. He bore the shame of Calvary so that I could share the glory. It's, it's really one of the most amazing gifts that this poor man ever left us. Finally, treasure number 10, he has promised his presence to be with us. It's a little bit confusing initially when we see the Lord Jesus standing there on the Mount of Olives and he says to them, I'm going away, right? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And then he adds, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So on the one hand, he's going away on the other hand, he's promising never to leave them. But he explains this in the upper room and he says, it's important that I go away, important for you that I go away, because if I don't go away, I can't come to you. And what he's saying is this, that when he was here physically on earth, if he was in Galilee, he wasn't in Judea. If he was talking with Peter, he wasn't talking with the Syrophoenician woman. But by going away through his spirit now, he could come to be with each one of us. So I have him all to myself. It's like the sunshine. 
I can enjoy it all for myself as if it's just shining on me. And so the Lord Jesus is all mine and nobody can interrupt that relationship. So I think this is one of the most transforming truths of everything the Lord gave us. I am with you. If we would practice the presence of Christ, not a spy, he's not, oh, did it again. He's there as a very present help. When I'm facing a crisis, he says, here, use this, here, try this. Here's something that'll help you in this circumstance. And he's administering grace. He's giving out his truth. He's helping me through these hard times. This has to be the most transforming moment. When I discover Jesus is my best friend and I share everything with him. And when I practice that in my daily experience, get up in the morning and make sure there's nothing between my soul and the Savior and I share everything with him through the day. That's the best possible day I can have. And so whatever else he gave us, initially he gave his life to us, but now he says, I'm giving my presence to you. I'm going to be your best friend. I'll never leave you. I'll be standing by a very present help in every circumstance. You can count on me. Whoever else turns away from you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. These are the things that the poorest man left us when he, for our sakes, became poor so that we, through his poverty, could become rich.